Ten years ago, all eyes were on the Japanese. In the race for world economic leadership, they seemed headed for victory. The Japanese were proud of the growth they'd achieved so quickly. Japan was the most productive country in the world, and the Japanese were the most industrious people. We felt we'd finally caught up with America. A whole country was said to share the same discipline and rigor, the same values. In northern Japan, even the local racehorses were expected to drag heavy loads over obstacles on their way to victory. I thought the Japanese were invincible. They seemed to be doing everything right, and they seemed to have so much money to make investments that they would be unstoppable. But the relentless advance was about to falter. In the 1990s, Japan was brought down by a severe recession. The burst of Japan's economic bubble destroyed savings and cost millions their jobs. Now the Japanese are trying to work out what went wrong and how to put it right. Five million, five million, five million, five hundred thousand. At the height of the boom in the late 1980s, there seemed nothing to which the Japanese couldn't aspire. They were suddenly so rich and their country so strong that the best the world had to offer seemed cheap. Impressionists and European masters were bid up to new heights. Japanese companies were spending billions on foreign investments. To Americans whose national icons fell into Japanese hands, it seemed like a takeover, from Manhattan to Hollywood. The Japanese had a new confidence, even arrogance. I felt great about it. I thought it was the East's revenge on Western capitalism. If it comes to it, I thought, we should buy all of the United States. We really should have bought more of America. Now Van Gogh's sunflowers were heading for Tokyo too. 22 million 500,000 pounds for the last time. What no one realized then was that the boom was false, a flimsy bubble blown up by cheap money and loose lending. It was to lead to one of the most devastating financial crashes of the century, with effects far beyond Japan. Now the search is on for the men who allowed it to happen, the very businessmen and bureaucrats Japan once trusted most. The series of wrong turnings and misjudgments which ended the Japanese miracle began in the early 1980s. Japan's manufacturers were so successful that they were pouring cars and televisions, bikes and cameras into the United States. With their jobs going, Americans wanted to strike back. America is up in arms, Mr. Speaker, and it would be a mistake to underestimate our frustrations. Unless this warning is heeded, retaliation and possibly full-blown trade warfare lie just around the corner. Finally, the Japanese gave in. At a meeting in New York's Plaza Hotel in 1985, they agreed to handicap their own exporters by engineering a stronger yen. 
Toyo Gyoten was a negotiator for the Japanese government. The Plus Accord was a kind of agreement which uh, accomplished much more than <laughs> everybody expected for the meeting. When we went to Plaza meeting, uh, we are quite prepared to uh, see substantial uh, increase in uh, yen's uh, value. The main point of the agreement was that the value of the Japanese yen should go up and the dollar down, so Japan's exports to the US wouldn't be so cheap. But the yen rose far faster than anyone expected, and Japanese officials grew alarmed. After the Plaza Accord, the yen shot up, and the age of high yen recession came. Our exports suffered, and people worried it might be an even more serious situation than the oil shock. Many feared the Japanese economy was under threat again. Fearing a recession, the bureaucrats made the first in a series of misjudgments. They eased credit restrictions, and they slashed interest rates. From 5%, they reduced the cost of borrowing with a succession of cuts until interest rates were the lowest in the world at 2.5% and held them there. The idea was to help manufacturers and get more spending in the shops, but the money went elsewhere. Borrowing at cheap rates, investors poured cash into the property market and land prices started to soar. In overcrowded Tokyo, land was scarce. Values were driven even higher when a government report said that the city would need still more office space as it strove to become a world financial center. Soon a land mania set in. Speculators fought for sites to develop. This patch of land used to be home to 15 families. Manabu Miyazaki was the middleman who persuaded them to sell, so the whole block of land could be put together. This site has soaked up so much money. We worked it out at the time in the bubble years that as a piece of real estate, Japan was worth the whole of the United States seven times over. There used to be a little coffee shop around the corner. Every morning, local people used to gather there and talked about when to sell the land they owned. Everyone was very excited in those days. The Japanese thought land was the safest and most secure of all investments. Better than gold. Land prices had never gone down, could never go down. It created so many deals and took so much cash in. Just tap here, you may hear banknotes. Susumu Saito heard them calling too and joined the land rush. By turning over property quickly, he became a multi-millionaire. I wasn't buying and selling as much as some others, but I had annual sales of four billion in those days. For instance, I put one site on the market at one and a half million yen per square meter. It was sold on through many other agents and eventually went for 10 times as much. I was worth 18 billion at the peak time. 
other song. As prices rippled out from Tokyo, farmers and smallholders became millionaires too, at least on paper. 60% of Japanese owned their own homes, and they felt richer than ever before. Two passions for land and for golf came together in a great golf club boom. Club memberships were priced according to the land value of the course and were bought and sold just like shares. My father became a member of this course 40 years ago and it then cost 800,000 yen. Eight hundred thousand was a lot of money at the time, of course, but it went up to two hundred million at the peak of the bubble. A huge difference. I doubt if anyone was prepared to pay that sort of money just because he wanted to play golf here. Persuasive developers like Suemitsu Ito had no difficulty borrowing huge sums from the banks to build brand new golf courses. His first one cost a hundred million pounds. Memberships for new courses sold like hotcakes in those days. It was no problem to sell memberships. Even if you spent 20 billion, which was what I invested in mine, it was easy to get it back. It's not true now, but back then, 20 billion felt like 2 billion, or even just 200 million. The actual value of money felt so small. This is 100 million in cash, quite heavy. Golf brokers worked like stockbrokers, but the memberships they traded were often bought and sold with cash. When a hundred billion was normal for a club membership, you became numb with money. I used to get on the train and just chuck my briefcase with ten million cash in it on the luggage rack. Unthinkable now. Back then, I had sales over a billion, maybe twice a week. We were dealing in unbelievable amounts. I think there were more than 20 golf courses with membership values over a hundred million. The exhilaration was shared by all ages. They're far from the Western stereotype of the fanatical, hard-working Japanese, but the young people at this fun fair are behind a consumer revolution which is changing the face of Japan's economy. Young Japanese were the first generation to grow up in a society that believed it had at last caught up with the West and, if anything, was more affluent. Spending company money, businessmen entertained each other with new extravagance. Say there were five of us going to a restaurant. It would cost anything up to 30 or 50,000 yen each. Then we'd go to Ginza to drink. We'd visit two or three different bars and spend about 100,000 at each bar. And with tips for waiters and hostesses, you'd pay 10 million for the whole evening quite easily. Presiding over this euphoria was the respected and all-powerful Ministry of Finance. Its bureaucrats took much of the credit for the post-war miracle, and they still guided everything the banks and stockbrokers did with a mix of legal controls and personal connections. Officials here thought the rising wealth was real enough. Yoshimasa Nishimura had joined the ministry's elite ranks in 1963. 
At the same time as we coped with the doubled yen, we started to believe our ability had doubled as well. We took a positive interpretation. We began to think our value had doubled. But then they encountered another setback. Good evening. Stock markets around the world are reeling from some of the biggest one-day falls in share values ever recorded. In New York tonight, the collapse is worse than the worst day of the notorious Wall Street crash of 1929. To the men at the Ministry of Finance, the stock market crash seemed another reason to stay on the course they'd chosen. They kept interest rates at their historic low. The concern in Japan that the economy might be uh, approaching the bubble stage, well, had to just evaporate. <laughs> uh, it was quite obvious that uh, it is not a time to talk about tightening. <laughs> I have to say that that was the only uh, choice we had, only alternative we had. But anyway, but the fact remains that we made a mistake. It was the second mistake. With money as easy to borrow as ever, land prices went on climbing. And the rising value of land fed back into the stock market and distorted that too. Japanese accounting allowed companies to pretend the rising value of the land their factories stood on was real profit. Whatever they were actually making, their notional real estate gains sent share prices spiraling upwards. They borrowed against their land, then issued company bonds to cover the debt. With interest rates still at 2.5%, money was virtually free. As long as everyone's making money, you sort of forget you know, about fundamentals and things like that. And as long as the market was going up, people were getting richer and they were spending the money and they were buying real estate, they are taking over U.S. companies. As long as the market was going up, everything was fine. Stockbroking firms were doing best of all. The most dynamic and fast growing was Sanyo Securities. They built a huge new trading floor hooked up to branches around the world. In a 1989 interview, their president seemed supremely confident. I think the long-term trend will be that share values will keep rising. The private financial assets of the Japanese already exceed $7,000 billion, and they'll continue to grow at nearly $800 billion a year. Sanyo's managing director was Michio Hayashi. I remember several days when we made a billion in commission. That means our total sales were over a hundred billion yen. We thought Japan was progressing from a trading nation with high technology into a finance nation with an even brighter future. Skyscrapers would be standing high in Tokyo Bay, just like Manhattan. The mood at that time was that there would be no end to it. As long as shares were rising, ordinary Japanese were happily swept along. Millions of small investors played the stock market in their spare time. It was stupid to leave your savings or retirement pay at the bank. Many of us wanted to do something better with our money. Evening classes in finance were packed with eager students. Those were exciting times. There's an important psychological factor dealing in stocks and shares. 
Even when you sold and made, say, 300,000, if the same share went up further and you could have made more, then you'd feel as though you'd lost money. We were wondering what to invest in all the time. Whether it was land, shares, golf memberships or paintings, everyone had a go at something. If you weren't in the game, people thought you were strange. Actually, to be blunt, they thought you were stupid. Despite the huge rise in land and stock prices, the government didn't intervene. As you can imagine, uh, when everybody was happy, <laughs> it's very difficult to say that uh, you are too happy, so you have to uh, uh, stop uh, doing what you are uh, doing now. Exhorting the public to borrow, Japanese banks played their own special part in pumping up the bubble. They were desperate to offer new loans, but there was almost no scrutiny of what the lending risk might be. They pressed cash on their customers, and so long as land was there as collateral, that was enough. Branch manager Akinori Yamashita was given an award for good performance in meeting the bank's goals. I never advised my customers to take out a loan for realistic needs, like buying new equipment. What I did mostly was to set them up for new loans by stimulating their subconscious demand. That's where I had to make an effort. So our approach had nothing to do with the actual business of the company. Their needs were drawn out by the bank, and the company followed our plan. The hundreds of thousands of small businesses who supplied the big companies were the mainstay of Japan's economy. By tradition, they were frugal and careful, but they became prime targets for the banks. To expand his metal plating factory, Kenichi Shigeta was talked into loans totaling over a million pounds. They used to push us to take up loans, even if we didn't need the money. With a business like this, sometimes orders go down, but you still have to keep the factory going. You need some working capital put aside, so you're encouraged to borrow a little extra. One example, when I asked for about 10 million, I needed to buy new equipment. They came back and told me to take 15 million. To safeguard their profits, it was in the bank's interest that land prices should continue up. Many banks became direct participants in the bubble through a system known as land pinball. It's because the banks fund the deals. They finance a purchase of land for 50 million one week, and they finance the sale of the same land for 60 million a week later. One month later, the same bank comes up with 65 million for the same land. That's how land prices go up, just like pinball. It looked as though prices were going up normally, but at the root of it, there was a bank. They'd find the next buyer themselves, and they'd lend money to the purchaser after that. 
要するに相手の財務内容を知ってるから By 1989, the public and politicians could see rising land prices were creating new divisions. Anyone already on the ladder who'd owned land when prices started to rise felt rich. But for families left behind, buying a house or flat seemed further and further out of reach, or might mean a hundred year mortgage. That December, the stock exchange index hit a new peak of nearly 39,000. Shares like land were at a giddy height. Prices go up. Because they go up, people buy more. Then, because people buy more, they go up again. It just repeats itself. Until finally, someone is left with the joker. If you believe the Nikkei index, the value of Japanese companies had gone up three times since 1985. In London and New York, share prices had only gone up 60% in the same period. Only a few dared to query this. The more I looked into it, the more suspicious I became. For example, I, I discovered that even though the market was rising so strongly, the underlying operating profits of manufacturers only grew 2% a year from 1980 to 1989. There was actually no growth in profits.、Uh, From their core businesses, all the growth was coming from you know, financial gains in the market or lower interest rates. And that made me really suspicious. And then I looked around at what companies were doing with the money they were raising while they were all putting it into、uh, brand new office buildings. That didn't sound very smart either. And then I、um, talked to the banks about how companies were raising money, and it seemed that companies were raising money in the market. And then using the proceeds to purchase the shares of other companies who were raising money in the market. And so it was a vast circle of money, but there was no real basis, no economic reality for the boom that Japan had. The Joker was about to be dealt. On the first day of 1990, doubts about the market spread, and share prices started to fall. Over the next two and a half years, they dropped 63%, accelerated by another piece of unlucky timing. The Ministry of Finance had by now decided to act on land prices. They had sent out orders that banks were to limit their lending to developers. These measures, designed to slow down property speculation, ended up almost smashing the whole economy. It was as though lots of cars were racing at a speed of 90 miles an hour. Several hundred of them, all bunched up. Leading them was the Ministry of Finance car. It suddenly braked hard, and all the cars behind went right into it. A major pileup. That was the burst of the bubble. Land prices started to drop in September 1991, but the ministry kept its lending restrictions in place. I remember that well, as I was in charge of the new real estate loan control. When land prices fell for the first time, we thought of withdrawing the restrictions, but most Japanese people would not have agreed with that. They thought that if we relaxed as soon as prices had dipped, they might easily shoot up again. Instead, the price of property fell two thirds. The mania that had been consuming Japan stopped. Grand projects planned at the height of the bubble were cancelled. Anyone who'd borrowed against land found their collateral almost useless. Bankers who'd lent so much against land saw their loans could never be recovered, and the crisis was made worse by the way the establishment came together to conceal the damage. For five years, the Ministry of Finance and the banks conspired to hide the level of bad debt.
1993 or 1994, We couldn't show a loss brought about by bad debts in case we triggered public panic and a run on the banks. There should have been a system whereby banks in difficulties could get back up cash or public funds, but at the time there wasn't one. The Ministry of Finance didn't allow us to make the debts public, so all the big corporations had to put them in separate debt accounts. Big Japanese companies tried to conceal their bad debts with ingenious accounting and the help of illegal payments and corporate racketeers known as Sokaya. At company meetings, directors and the chairman avoid answering difficult questions by having their Sokaya shout, let the proceedings continue, and clapping loudly. Even though the irregularities are obvious, inspectors don't point them out. And although they've checked the firm and know there's something wrong, auditors also keep quiet. The close-knit hierarchical system that had been Japan's strength in the years of catching up now stopped businesses admitting the damage they'd sustained or learning from their mistakes. In Japan, you can't just say you're sorry. Normally, you have to commit suicide or at least quit your job if you're the director of a company. And that's why they're so reluctant to let the world know that they made a mistake. There's a belief that directors are lords, so if something happens, it must be hidden. Whether it's sokaya, yakuza, or police payoffs, companies that have something to hide will just distribute money. For five years, Japan Inc. attempted to gloss over the difficulties. But the economic crisis in the rest of Asia made things worse. And by now, the seamy practices that had flourished under the bubble were starting to come out too. There'd been years of greed, corruption and fraud. In 1997, investigators were sent into three of the biggest stockbrokers. The companies were accused of bribing officials, manipulating prices, and concealing debt. It was only the first of a series of shocks that undermined public faith in the old Japanese system. When the fast-growing Sanyo Securities ran up huge debts, they expected a government rescue plan. On November the 3rd, we were all called in, and I went to work thinking Sanyo Securities was about to announce major restructuring and job cuts, and that I'd have to justify them. But when I got there, I saw the company lawyer. I couldn't quite work out why. I thought it was strange. It was then, for the first time, I heard Sanyo would be applying for bankruptcy. It was like the blue sky had cracked in two. In November, the government allowed another stockbroker to go down, Yamaichi Securities.
Yamaichi directors had concealed off-balance sheet debts of over one billion pounds. Share certificates were returned to anxious investors. And the company president showed his anguish in public. So far, the banks, at least, had stayed protected by the Ministry of Finance. But the net was to be pulled from under them, too. Three clearing banks were allowed to go bust. Even two of the industrial banks that had helped rebuild Japan after the war went bankrupt, all brought down by real estate deals. How fragile our system was. Suddenly we were in the middle of the free market. There was nowhere else to go. So you just conned your customers and gambled their surplus money. The speed and shock of the collapse took even the bank's directors by surprise. I hadn't realized how frightening a market economy could be. It was like a bankruptcy and a novel. It happened so quickly. The bank had tried to hide 3.5 billion pounds. The entire board resigned and three were later arrested. As blue chip names were brought down, small investors grew alarmed. Bank staff tried to reassure worried customers that their savings were safe. Japanese television turned the traumas of the bubble into a popular new series. From heaven to hell. Each week it brought a succession of victims into its hot seat to see whose debts were the hugest. さらに主従殺者級を抱える衝撃の転落人生。バブル崩壊を伊藤高尾さんです。いやいや、本当に良くしていただきました。この手で10億を手玉にしてたんですから。<笑><笑> It was only the scale of this man's debts that was exceptional. The same stories of financial disaster were being repeated all over Japan. In Tokyo, Kenichi Shigeta was called in by his bank. They told him to repay his loans, but the land against which he'd borrowed was worth only a third of what it had been. He still owes over a million pounds. When I think of how things were then, now is unbelievable. I used to employ almost 40 people in and out of the two factories constantly. Now it's become a family operation. Just four of us shrunk to 10%. In northern Japan, 500 miles from Tokyo, the crash was particularly harsh.
on the island of Hokkaido, where the local sport was racing the draft horses who once pulled timber out of the forests, locals considered themselves even tougher than the rest of the country. But the region was put through new hardships when its main bank collapsed, bringing down thousands of small businesses in its wake. What we had slipped through our fingers, went up like smoke. I was appalled. How could a major bank disappear just like that? There was nothing we could do. They didn't allow us to do anything. Nobuyuki Sasaki's machine factory had been making a profit despite the recession. But when the Takagin bank collapsed, his loans were suddenly called in. This was my dream. I wanted to pass this on to my son. I wanted to do something for the man I trust, the man I love. That's what I wanted in the beginning. Every time I look at this, I'm lost for words. In one year, 17,000 small businesses went bankrupt. Kohei Ishibashi runs a company that deals in second-hand machine tools. It must be like losing your own child. You've worked hard taken years to raise your child. Everything here costs money. It may look like rubbish, but nothing was free. Each thing has some sentimental value. Once I went to take some equipment away, and the owner's wife had polished and shone the machine. We got it on the truck, and she was waving at it until it went out of sight. It would bring tears to your eyes. For some, the shame proved finally unbearable. On the slopes of Mount Fuji, there's an area of forest to which Japanese traditionally go when they want to kill themselves. Each autumn, the police search for the season's victims. The national suicide rate, already one of the highest in the world, went up 35% in 1998. The police reckon that three and a half thousand people committed suicide for what they describe as economic reasons. <laughs> Ten years on, all Japanese are getting used to a changed world. The construction workers who built the bubble's new landmarks are on the streets. Companies that paid huge sums for paintings have had to sell them. And the Rockefeller Center has been returned to American hands. Even those who made their fortunes from the bubble now lead different lives. Suemitsu Ito, the developer who built scores of golf courses and hotels with borrowed money, has been convicted of fraud. There is no guilty conscience on my part. The whole of Japan was doing the same thing with the same intentions. Bankers, 
company owners, everyone. Susumo Saito, the developer who bought and sold property, faces debts of 25 million pounds. At the height of the bubble, this site was worth 1.8 billion yen. Since the burst, it's been sold for a tenth of the price. Mr. Saito is trying to build a new career as a singer. His theme is one that has come to obsess all Japanese. Who is to blame? We couldn't possibly have foreseen that the value of land in Japan would fall as much. 70% in only seven or eight years. I'm afraid that at that time, uh, entire Japan was uh, thrown into a kind of euphoria and uh, balanced right judgment was very scarce. It was the government's weakness that they couldn't take bold decisions. The fact that Japan was unused to a market economy, that we were so weak and inexperienced, that we had been protected by government regulations and the rigid system. These were the biggest reasons for our financial failure. The effects of the bubble have gone far beyond the economy. They forced the Japanese to question the whole basis of the system that did so well for them. The government now talks of the need for reform in every area, in industry and management, in politics, in education. But ordinary Japanese, battered and skeptical, don't know whom or what to believe. A life and death drama is played out at the Bridgestone Tire Company in Tokyo. Up on the ninth floor, a 58-year-old manager has burst in to see the company president. Masaharu Nonaka is protesting at the way the president is trying to restructure Bridgestone. Listing his grievances, he says loyal workers are being discarded like torn up rags. As he gets more excited, he produces two long knives. Then he strips off his shirt and plunges a blade into his stomach in a ritual suicide. Japan's first corporate harakiri gets massive coverage. Millions of workers identify with him. He's expressed their deepest fears, that under the pressure of a long recession, the Japanese system of management that gave them security and identity is being abandoned. A 
few years ago, Japanese workers were told they were the best, that no one could beat their system. Suddenly, big corporations are in turmoil, and new faces are taking charge. When you look at what's happened, it is really only the tip of the iceberg. There is monumental change that's going to uh, uh, be undertaken in the next uh, five to ten years as all of the companies in Japan work very hard to, uh, to be com uh, globally competitive. Even the managers who lived through the bubble years acknowledge they have to break with the past. We have to make a dramatic change in our organization and business practices and everything. Unless otherwise, we really cannot survive in the next century. The Japanese were proud of the teamwork, consensus and discipline which made their system of managing companies so different to the West's. Big companies provided employment for life along with cheap housing, health plans and pensions. In return, they expected loyalty and commitment. Mr. Matsushita, founder of the company that made Panasonic, believed his employees were part of one family. No one was ever fired. He said forming human character was more important than making electrical goods. But the system had turned Japan into a world-beating exporter. Foreign academics and businessmen made pilgrimages to study how they'd done it. One book had a special impact. I could see that we were going to be in real trouble competitively with the Japanese products. And I wanted to make Americans wake up to that challenge. Uh, when uh, I met uh, the Matsushita, who developed the big company Matsushita, he said, you know, you're an American patriot. Uh, and I think that's basically right, that I was writing that book for Americans to try to stir them up to respond to the challenge from Japan. I saw uh, Japanese working together well, high morale, high education levels, uh, good cooperation, high quality. Uh, and I knew they were going to beat us out in manufacturing markets. I could see the speed with which they were coming up. Visiting Americans like the Westinghouse Group are always impressed with the loyalty between Japanese companies and their workers. It is uniquely Japanese. They all work very, very closely together. Their bottom line is uh, not, not what is in it for me, but what's in it for us. In the 1980s, the Japanese started to export their methods as well. When Toyota bought a car factory in America, they tried to re-educate their employees. The Japanese were the teachers. The first Japanese car plant in Europe was built by Nissan in Sunderland. To avoid the them and us disputes that had crippled Britain's own car companies, 
Nissan trained a new workforce. They are very receptive to new ideas. They come to Japan, uh, find, uh, find out uh, what's good about Japanese management and what needs to be changed uh, uh, in the UK. What they liked best was teamwork, a great teamwork of people, uh, people cooperating with each other for the same objective. Uh, final checks, they're doing all right. They do work better, and the reason they work better for two points uh, stands out a mile, you know. And we've got it here now. That's teamwork and the right amb uh, attitude. If you get those two ingredients, and I never had them in my last industry, you'll succeed. <laughs> Even seasoned American car workers acknowledged they'd learned something. I also know Hitokashi wa Hitokashi Hitokashi Kikita. As they stormed into new markets, Japanese businessmen thought they were unstoppable. Japan's businessmen took the lead in sector after sector. Toshiba became one of the world's biggest makers of semiconductors. The latter part of the 1980s was especially glorious uh, years for Toshiba because of our uh, semiconductor memory product was the dominant force around the world. And I myself was in charge of uh, worldwide marketing and sales of the, of the semiconductors. So those were glorious days. Japan boasts an enviable record in successful satellite launches. It has clearly signaled its intention to go into aerospace in a big way. Japanese companies enjoyed soaring profits. They borrowed millions to build huge new plants. But at the end of 1989, the boom peaked. In just 18 months, the stock exchange slumped by 60%. And as business confidence fell, so did demand for goods. Though many big exporters were still making money, the domestic economy collapsed. At Hiroshima, Mazda had tens of thousands of unsold cars. The company was in such dire straits that even the bosses were dispatched to drum up sales. The managing director called on a local taxi firm. As the recession continued longer and bit deeper than anyone had expected, companies transferred workers around and closed older plants. The Japanese continued to believe their traditional strengths would get them through the recession. Fighting spirit, shared resolve, the capacity to stick together. They still believed it was a temporary problem from which they would soon recover. I think the largest obstacle was the lack of sense of crisis. 
amongst our employees, which again is the situation until recently in Japan. People would talk about it, but people wouldn't act on it because the sense of crisis was not that imminent. It was the wider Asian crash of 1998 that delivered the coup de grace and made businessmen realize they couldn't go on in the same way. Large companies were in crisis. Toshiba, which made everything from laptops to power stations, was one of them. A new president described their plight. Taizo Nishimura, Toshiba's new boss, had spent 10 years in America and promised to act quickly. But he failed to stave off the company's first loss for 23 years. I feel terrible, naturally. But at the same time, uh, in order to make change, this is a good uh, shock treatment for the company to make uh, all the changes. To turn Toshiba around, he wanted to cut staff. But as in the case of all large companies, he was constrained in what he could do. To make layoffs is very difficult in Japanese uh, labor regulation. Simply fire the people is against the law. So we have to get the consensus or consent, at least, from that employee whom we are hiring. <laughs> Taking their lead from each other, large companies still stuck to the principle of lifetime employment. So the shock was the greater when one of the largest and most conservative companies of all, the epitome of traditional management style, announced it was changing. Each morning at Matsushita Electric, they still repeat their founder's creed. But the company's patriarch would have been horrified by the scheme unveiled in 1998. The iron links that have chained employees to employer were to be optional. Old-style lifetime employment was enshrined in the pay system. Workers couldn't leave because rises were limited, until at 60, they finally got a huge lump sum. Under the new optional system, Managers can draw this pension money each month. Whether they invest it in a private pension or spend it is up to them. Each year, up to 800 graduates join Matsushita, and for the past two years, they've been given a choice of contracts. Management said this would encourage a different sort of recruit. <laughs> Unless we changed our traditional methods of employment, talented and ambitious young people, many with specialist skills, wouldn't have come to our company. That was the consensus among all the directors. We believe that the company must cater for these talents, that it has to be a place where they can fulfill themselves. That's why we are encouraging this new contract system. When Miho Sasaki gave the formal speech on the recruit's behalf, the first woman to do so, she seemed to be endorsing a very long-term approach. Matsushita Kounosuke Sogyosha wa Shouwa 7 nen ni 250 nen keikak toyu suuseki no oyobu keikak o tateta to kiite orimasu.
発見想像この手で成し遂げることを誓い But Ms. Sasaki's apparent orthodoxy didn't stop her from taking one of the new short-term contracts herself. I wasn't thinking of leaving Matsushita when I made my decision. My reason for choosing the new contract was that I wanted to use the extra pay to improve my skills. The best time to make this investment is when you're young. <laughs> I'll be spending the extra money on language tuition so that I could become an interpreter later. This means I could leave the company if I want to. I've no idea if I will, but I'm increasing my options. Over the past two years, more than 40% of graduate recruits, all of whom have to do time on the assembly line, have taken the new contract. Traditionalists fear the new system will undermine the legendary commitment and loyalty. Under the old lifetime employment system, people are loyal to the company even after they have lost interest in their actual work. But we don't want that sort of half-hearted loyalty anymore. We now hope employees will be able to align their personal aims with the company's. And that they'll stick with us because we share a common interest. We need to establish a more active and conscious loyalty amongst our staff. As companies struggle to cope with the downturn of the 1990s, reformers questioned another once admired feature of Japanese management. The way decisions were reached by consensus. It was meant to work like this. A lower level employee circulates a formal memo to his superiors, suggesting some change or new idea. As the memo moves its way through the company, peers and superiors either sign or append suggestions. Through this consensus decision-making approach, a new idea is either implemented or discarded. From a Western perspective, the ringy system of decision by group consensus seems time-consuming and unwieldy. But the power of the ringy system lies in the joint responsibility all signers share for the successful implementation of the new idea. Consensus decision-making works in a way that if you're confronted with a problem uh, as a company, you go down to the people who are really involved with the problem or are coping with the problem, uh, get them to come up with recommendation as to what to do, and then what the top says is, all right, you go ahead and do it that way. Therefore, it is very difficult to introduce, let's say, radical changes. You can change, introduce slight changes, but very difficult to introduce, let's say, revolutionary changes. There are six experts working in this company. How do you find this? Professor Ishikura, who gives English language business courses, believes consensus decision-making, far from being a virtue, represents a Japanese weakness. When you have other people who have formed the traditional core competence of our company, what would you do with these people? Decision-making is very difficult in Japan, partly because we have always been taught there is always the right solution, right answer to the question. And we have been taught in grade school and primary school that there is the answer to the question, to any one of the questions. And so if you challenge that, you get uh, ostracized or whatever, and you're not supposed to challenge this big authority or right solution, right answer to the problem. Actually, How do you uh, respond to that? But uh, in my own opinion, so... Yeah. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh, Would you like to... But, uh, well, yeah. But uh, my, my own opinion is the yeah. uh, same as his. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can argue, but... Uh, she tries to get students to adopt a more assertive Western style of decision-making. As 
Sak Sang, what is the profitability in your business? Uh, my, my industry, 20%. I think it, it's a matter of the, if you get a right product and if you get it right in at, ta, in, at the right moment, okay. if it's so tougher, it's basic. If you were top, if you were no top. matter what, you have to make a decision. You have to tell me what you think. Is the industry attractive? What are you going to do if you're top management? And you can't just say, I don't have enough information or I don't know, I'm not a top management. That's your job and you need to practice it. And so that the marketing manager is just in the trouble. So we, we don't have time to have a, a kind of a power game in the company. We have to decide which direction we should go. When he took over as president of Toshiba, Mr. Nishimura wanted to behave like an American chief executive and take rapid decisions on his own. He slimmed the company's headquarters and then reformed the board of directors itself. Board of Directors, the number used to be 34. And uh, the board meeting was very, very dull. With uh, 34 members, uh, there's no, no dialogue or no, no discussion practically. I felt that uh, it is not proper. And we have to energize the Board of Directors meeting with the spirit of in-depth review and discussions. The simplest way is to reduce the number. And uh, reduce the number, we, last year we reduced the number from 34 down to 12. The greatest jolt to Japanese management pride came at Hiroshima, where Mazda was losing a million dollars a day by the mid-90s. Mazda was 去年4月、衝撃的な発表を行いました。アメリカの自動車メーカー、フォードの傘下に入る。A new team of managers arrived at Mazda, which then employed 26,000 workers. I think that there was abject horror locally and nationally that uh, a Westerner uh, was coming into the company uh, as president of a Japanese company. I think that they, they were horrified for the most part. I think that was one of the biggest concerns. The Ford team, uh, as it was identified, was going to come in and slash and burn. <laughs> to the relief of Mazda's house union, they managed to reduce the numbers through early retirement and a halt in recruitment, the usual corporate way. But there was a temporary pay cut. The hardships we've suffered were not caused by Ford, but by the previous Japanese management, which had been lax in restructuring our company. In fact, we had to make some sacrifices, or we would not have survived. We just had to go through with them. Japanese management wasn't getting results. And they knew it. To get itself back to par, a floundering oil company brought in an experienced American manager, Donald Romano. ことと stop the losses at Koa, Romano wanted a complete overhaul. But he found the company's culture stood in his way. There seems to be, and I've heard it a lot, yes, but. And you see it every day. Yes, we can do that, but. There's a, a rule or a regulation or a law or a process or a problem that uh, causes us difficulty to do that. So if you keep uh, trying, keep trying, well then 
you can finally break through and get things done. But there's this immediate wall of resistance. To help him demolish the wall of resistance, Romano called in the consultants. Their scheme to reorganize the company would reduce the layers of management from 11 to 5. Romano wanted a more informal atmosphere and made Friday a dress down day. And he took on another central feature of Japanese management pay by seniority. He told younger staff why the change was needed. This is difficult for us because how do young people get ahead? How do they really make an input to the company? There's nothing for them to gain. Our pay structure will be changed. Our uh, merit increases, our bonuses, uh, they will be based on how well the company does and how much we contribute to the company. So it will, it will not matter if you're 50 years old or you're 30 years old. Uh, that's not going to be important. What's going to be important is how you perform in the company. The traditional respect for age was also challenged at Mazda. In the past, managers hadn't been made directors till they reached their late 50s. But President Miller started to promote much younger men. In the design department, he visited his latest nominee to the board, who is a mere 41. I think that he is probably the youngest Japanese director of a major or of a listed company other than a family member in a family business. Already, the feedback that's come to me from the employees has been very positive. They're shocked because it's extraordinarily radical to have someone that age uh, as a director of the company. But he happens to be a superbly talented young man that can make a significant contribution to the company for many years. We used uh, this uh, approach, mm -hmm. and uh, finally, my English isn't so good, and I could understand only half of what Mr. Miller said when he appointed me. But to be serious, the fact was that my youth was one of the reasons why I was chosen. We need a different approach to quality improvement. Youth is necessary to get that new approach. That's what Mr. Miller said to me. Pay and promotion by merit were resented by many older managers. I have seen a situation in which with certain companies, people in their 40s uh, now have to report uh, to, uh, to staff in the, in, in, in the early 30s with a higher income. Yes, you could easily uh, kick off uh, those people in their 40s. Uh, if you do that, then uh, you know, these people uh, in their 40s will lose incentive. I think they will lose their, their drive to work hard. The way big companies maintained close relationships with their small suppliers was another tradition that began to crack. In Hiroshima, hundreds of small factories did most, if not all, their business with Mazda. In exchange for loyalty, the mother company would help out in times of difficulty. The suppliers were not necessarily the cheapest, but they were family. After years of declining orders, the Mazda suppliers were summoned to hear that Ford wanted to end these cozy relationships. We've tried to make it very clear that uh, we are focusing on purchasing 
components or parts uh, or services based on the fundamentals of the business. Uh, world-class quality, world-class cost, world-class technology, and world-class delivery. And have made it quite clear to people that they need to meet those criteria in order to be competitive uh, uh, in their business dealings with them. Nakamura Manufacturing made impact bars to reinforce car doors. They had depended totally on Mazda. After years of cutting their costs, they found it difficult to cope with a new, more ruthless approach. Typically, the ones that are uncomfortable with it are, one, are companies that are not globally competitive in one or more of those categories I just mentioned, quality, cost, technology, or, or delivery. Nakamura tried to find customers elsewhere. Mr. Nakamura cut his workforce from 70 to 15. Finally, he decided to close the factory. He was in no position to offer the generous early retirement terms large companies could manage. After 40 years in business, it was the last payday. より残念でございますけど、まあ今後いろんな道を、え、中村製作所以外の道をまあ、ずっと思いますけど、それでは十分気をつけて、一つ、あの、よろしくお願いします。まあ、本日に至る、至り、皆さんにも、あの、迷
Last year, unemployment peaked at just under 5%, more than double the 1990 figure. Redundancy has traumatized the middle-aged salarymen who'd expected to stay with their firms until they reached retirement. When Japanese television takes its cameras into employment exchanges, called Hello Work Offices, many insist their faces are blanked out. The shame is so acute that they don't want people to know they're there. We live in a block of flats. Neighbors notice you're not going to work anymore and they start gossiping. They stare at you and wonder, have you been sacked? In Japan, it's generally thought losing your job is your own fault. People think you get fired because you're an incompetent worker. Mr. Toyota is fighting a rearguard action to get his job back. He and his fellow unionists have been trying to alert the public to the methods some companies use to get rid of people who won't go voluntarily. Over the course of two years, I was steadily demoted, from branch manager right down to just a plain clerk. And as my status shrank, my salary commissions and share of the company profits went down too. I was given a desk on my own, away from other people. At the beginning, my desk had a phone, but after a time, that was taken away. I was well and truly isolated. I ended up with nobody working for me, which was psychologically difficult. My pride was hurt. This was hard in all sorts of ways. But of course, that was the company's intention. In Osaka, a growing number of former office workers are joining the homeless. Because big companies have traditionally provided welfare, there is little state aid for those who have lost their jobs. Some have no money. Others make themselves homeless because they feel so humiliated. They can't face their families. The government does nothing for people like me. They should be ashamed, not me. In my worst nightmares, I would never have imagined that I could end up like this. I haven't even told my children where I am. To cut costs, employers are outsourcing and turning to the new temporary staff agencies which have grown up so quickly. The longest established is Persona, which sees itself as a model new style company, where pay and promotion have always been by performance, and half the managers are women. Yasuyuki Nambu has become a millionaire after setting up the business 25 years ago. A relentless self-publicist, Nambu uses his networking skills to promote his company. Temporary staffing has completely taken root alongside the Japanese lifetime employment system. 
And not only women, but also middle-aged men, younger people, and even students are using it. The unions believe temp agencies like Persona are another nail in the coffin of lifetime employment. When the union tried to deliver a letter to Persona, the two sides were soon locked in a procedural argument. The new insecurity among white collar workers has even been reflected in the TV commercials for energy drinks. Ten years on, the stereotype businessman is now distracted. To survive the recession, he needs the pick-me-up. Some hope there may still be a uniquely Japanese answer to fiercer competition abroad and falling orders at home. More traditional companies continue to send their staff away to toughening up courses known as hell training. They emphasize the quintessential national qualities. But most Japanese acknowledge that character forming simply won't be enough. When the most senior businessmen gather for their annual assembly, their leaders speak with a new rhetoric. Japan is now engrossed in a debate about how that revolution should be driven through and whether the business establishment can adjust to it. In Japan, on the way up, when they were catching up, the goals were very clear. They could see what they were aiming at, they would see where they had to go, and people could work together very well. But once they had caught up with the West, the goals were no longer that clear. And the same kind of organization that worked well uh, was not always the most effective. To recover, Americans tell them they have no choice but to take the more ruthless American way and put shareholder value above all else. Not everyone accepts this. I don't think we have, we have thought through yet. Uh, we are simply saying that uh, we have, you know, we, we, we have to make change and the, the only change model we have uh, is America. So we have to follow that. Whatever is happening in America is good. I think that sort of thinking is, is not appropriate for Japan because 
Japan is different uh, from America, and uh, America could be uh, could be having their, their their deep problems in a few years' time. The leaders of the largest companies maintain it's possible to keep the old social contract and look after the interests of shareholders and employees. There are things we can change, but at the same time, there are things we have to maintain. And I wish to make changes as much as possible, but at the same time, I wish to retain the good part or the heart of the Japanese business. Their harshest critics see the big companies as dinosaurs. They say the future lies with smaller, nimbler, more entrepreneurial companies like their own. If traditional companies stay the way they are, natural selection will take its toll. In 50 or 100 years' time, I think those companies will be gone. They just won't survive. Because employees will build up their own knowledge and expertise and will simply find better places to work. For many, it's a question of identity. For years, they emphasized the uniqueness of the Japanese way. In the age of globalization, they've learned they're subject to the same market forces and insecurities as everyone else. At the start of a new century, Japan is on the moon. After 10 years of recession and bad news, a new generation wants to break with the country's conservative course and head in a new direction. A few years ago, not many Japanese politicians could windsurf. In Japan, people always did what had been done before. That was fine when the economy was growing. But now things are reversed, and we can't carry on like that. They think they have to change how they play, to face up to new competition. If you stick to conventional Japanese ways, you'll get left behind. If you have no individual ability, you don't have a chance, do you? Traditionally, we've been dependent, complacent, and ambiguous. When problems arose, we just postponed dealing with them. But we can't afford to do that anymore. To save Japan, they say national attitudes have to change. That the country's economy and closed political system have to open up. Japan's long slump has reached into every part of the country, hitting coastal communities and farms as much as factories and offices. Matsukawa Ura on the north coast lives by its fishing fleet. Each morning their catch is auctioned to buyers from industrial cities hundreds of miles away on the other side of Japan. Because all Japanese are spending less in the shops, fishermen now get lower prices and demand has fallen. The Kono family own their own boat. They worry whether their children will be able to carry on the family business. We usually catch fish like sole and bream. But consumers don't want expensive fish like that anymore. There isn't much money around. 
We used to be able to sell our fish at a good price. But with the burst of the bubble, fish prices went right down. Five hours from Tokyo, Matsukawa Ura never saw the wilder excesses of the bubble's rise. But it shared the national nightmare that followed the fall. As property and stock prices plummeted after 1990, the second richest country in the world went into economic freefall. After the crash, thousands of small businesses found they couldn't carry on as banks called in their loans. Unemployment rose to a record high as firms told loyal workers to go. Scandal and humiliation hit the country's most trusted institutions. The confidence that had risen with Japan's post-war wealth was replaced by growing despair. And if people expected their politicians to rescue them, they were disappointed. From the early 1990s, a succession of governments tried and failed to deal with the crisis. Instead of dealing with the recession's real causes, they simply did what they'd always done before, poured in cash for public works. The idea was to prime the economic pump and get people spending again. In a pork barrel frenzy, the cash was shared out to every part of the country, whether or not it was actually needed. The mountainous district of Fukushima got a major new airport. There were new concert halls and harbors, motorways and tunnels. Even Matsukawa Ura got a new bridge. In nine years, they spent over 400 billion pounds, the equivalent of 40 channel tunnels. You have to imagine roads built in areas where there are hardly any cars, or going through tunnels that can lead absolutely nowhere because on the other side is merely a bridge and the bridge goes straight into a granite wall of a mountain. You have to look at the way in which riverbeds are covered with concrete just to spend money. By 1999, they had run up a 900 billion pound deficit, but with no success in lifting the burden of recession. <laughs> the government grew so desperate, it tried literally giving money away. They printed free coupons and sent a hundred pounds worth to 35 million people to spend in the hope of reviving stricken businesses. But the scheme still didn't bring any pickup. People just spent the coupons and saved their own cash. Since he retired from teaching nine years ago, Kikua Watanabe has had the worries of all Japanese pensioners. With interest rates at a mere half a percent, he gets almost no returns on his savings. And he wasn't impressed by the giveaway coupons. The government wanted to boost the economy any way it could, but those coupons did absolutely nothing. From a political point of view, it was a poor, shoddy policy. They should have done better. By the end of the decade, there had been no less than nine government stimulus packages. But the shops stayed empty. The public were worried that even harder times might be ahead they still wouldn't go out and spend. It's been recently verified that the government supplied uh, actually coupon to people, and many people didn't use the coupon even. In other words, they've got money provided by, by even the government, and they don't still have something to buy. Um, do, do we want to buy more suits? You know, we have full of suits in a closet. 
Do we want to buy more shoes? Full of shoes in, in the house. More cars, enough cars. Education, kids are fed up with education. In these frugal times, one of the few retailing successes were 100 yen shops. Their attraction in the second richest country in the world was that nothing cost more than 60p. I look at flyers and do my shopping in the cheapest places. If a supermarket offers to refund the consumption tax, I always go there, and so do a lot of housewives. The offer might be only for a limited period, but in that short time, thousands of us go to do our shopping. When I see scenes like that, I really feel that we are in a recession. As the depression continued, it gave more and more ammunition to those who for years had criticized the whole system by which Japan was governed. From the politicians in parliament, to their big business cronies, to the bureaucrats in their ministries, the Japanese establishment had shared the same beliefs. Nowhere enshrined those values and attitudes better than Tokyo University. Each year, new entrants to the country's top educational institution were drafted into the elite circle which ran Japan. Japan was seen as a corporate state in which business interests came before consumers and bureaucrats knew best. Tokyo graduates were guaranteed top jobs in the largest companies and banks, the civil service or in politics. If they aspired to politics, there was only one party that counted. The Liberal Democrats had presided over Japan's post-war miracle and held power for 48 years, sustained through a web of personal connections and nepotism. It was quite normal for a son to follow in his father's political footsteps. The father's privileges would be passed to the son, and so the family tradition carried on. But only the people at the top benefited from this system. It didn't help ordinary citizens like us. The Liberal Democrats were split into factions. Because candidates from several factions would stand for each seat at election time, they needed patrons with plenty of money and influence to win. Backroom fixers could make or break political careers. Prime Ministers themselves were often no more than party placemen. In practice, real power was held not by Parliament, but by bureaucrats. They controlled policies and even defended them in the Diet. Tsutomu Hata was briefly Prime Minister in 1994. The bureaucrats also gained from our long-running one-party rule. They protected and secured their own positions. It wasn't easy either to break that tradition or to push it to one side. It would have taken great determination and force from a prime minister to achieve any reform. Frustrated by the Liberal Democrats' failure to reform, Ichiro Ozawa, one of its most influential backroom heavies, broke away with others to launch a new opposition party in 1993. I think the problem lies in the fact that Japanese society is too strongly regulated. Politicians, businessmen, bureaucrats, they're all closely linked, right at the very top. Even before the recession, it was an outsider who made the most devastating analysis of how the country worked. In a best-selling book called The Enigma of Japanese Power, Karl von Wolfram concluded 
that no one was really in charge at all. Well, I pointed at what I thought and still think is a fundamental defect of the Japanese political system. And that is that there is no center of political accountability. So in other words, no person or group of people that are ultimately expected to worry about the fate of Japan. Each year, Japanese fishermen pray for their own part in Japan's prosperity at a traditional sea festival. For Matsukawa Ura, where the festival's to be held this year, it's a reminder of their old identity. One focus for that identity is the emperor. Today, he's coming to the town for the first time. With politicians discredited, the emperor is the one part of the old system still held in high regard. The pre-war national anthem is played in schools again, and the government has encouraged use of the national flag. Trying to capitalize on the imperial glow, they say the flag and anthem can reinforce what it means to be Japanese. At the quayside, the Kono family has been up since dawn, cleaning their boat and raising the festival flags in the emperor's honor. They too are tired of old-style politicians and their closed world. It seems as though a handful of top politicians decide everything and try to control us all. I don't want that kind of politics. I want politicians to listen to us and respect what we've got to say. Politics should be based on people, otherwise Japan won't change. As the need for fundamental reform is accepted by more people, new faces are being drawn into politics. A seaside town near Tokyo now has the former windsurfing champion as its mayor. It's a characteristic of Japan that people tend to avoid open debate. Japanese people dislike the frank exchange of opinions, unlike Westerners. To avoid losing face, everything is decided beforehand, and official meetings are just a formality. That's how things have been done in Japan. That's why people have lost confidence in politics. We need to open up more and encourage people to join in open debate. The debate's not just on the fringes. Makiko Tanaka inherited her constituency from her father, a former Liberal Democrat Prime Minister. She's benefited from the old system but she also believes politics has to open up. It's vital for the government to explain to the public what it plans to do and to disclose information. But that kind of transparency is lacking, so the public is kept in the dark. Suddenly a law is passed, but people don't know how or why. Even more seasoned campaigners have broken ranks to criticize the system they grew up with. Maverick politician Shintaro Ishihara left the Liberal Democratic Party and ran for governor of Tokyo. We Liberal Democrats were a conservative party and we stuck to our beliefs. We came up with some new policies, but we never broke out of the conservative mold. We could never escape from this bureaucratic shell. The LDP itself has had to adapt. The realization that voters blamed them for the crash came with a humiliating defeat in 1993. Though they were soon back in power, it was in coalition with others they failed to deal with the recession. But under public pressure, they did start cautious political reform. 
Today they're meeting to re-elect their party leader. Keizo Obuchi became prime minister in 1998, when Japan was almost drowning in red ink. Financial reform should have started 10 years ago. Debts from the bubble should have been paid back when the bubble burst. That's when our financial reform should have taken place. How can I put it? For 10 years, we didn't have the major surgery we needed. We just took anti-fever remedies and various minor measures until our heart was about to give out. When I came into office, the whole system was on the verge of collapse. Obuchi appointed not a traditional bureaucrat, but a former writer to carry out more radical surgery. Taichi Sakaya. What's needed most in rebuilding the Japanese economy is to construct a free market centered around consumers. Japan functioned within the bureaucratic mass production system for so long, there's no concept of a consumer-based market. We need to root this concept in the minds of the Japanese people. We have to make people believe in the free market. That's our biggest task. After the corruption cases that shocked the public in the early 90s, the Liberal Democrats now try to appear squeaky clean. <laughs> Obuchi's predecessors brought in new laws that reduced influence peddling and made business donations to individual politicians illegal. <laughs> Away from the back rooms, when the public gets to vote, the system's also been changed. The days of having to choose between candidates from different LDP factions are over. Most constituencies now only have one contender from each party. And it is now government ministers, not senior bureaucrats, who must answer questions before Parliament. We need to become virtuous as a nation. I think that this can be exemplified by Mount Fuji, a symbol of Japan. It is written with the characters Fu, which means wealth, and Shi, which means the heart or will. We need to achieve both of them so that Japan can become a nation of integrity. Heavy with symbolism, there's even a scheme to shift the government altogether away from polluted, earthquake-threatened Tokyo to a new site. Fukushima is one of ten prefectures fighting to get it. They want the new capital built here, in the mountains between Matsukawa-ura and Tokyo. They're campaigning to secure it on television. Takanari Hiruta is in charge of local attempts to bring the capital to Fukushima. There are many reasons why the Japanese economy is in its current state. But what we need to do now is to get out of the familiar way of thinking that's prevailed since the war and look at things from a fresh standpoint. We should combat the recession that way. We need to start changing our basic values, and a brand new capital will be the triggering device for that. 
Japan's parliament could be standing here early this century. It's meant to lay the ghosts of official corruption. The prime reason for moving the capital is to separate politics and business. Business will still be run in Tokyo, but politics will be administered from the new capital. We want to draw a line between the two. But few think Japan can change all on its own. And pressure from outside is already forcing the pace. Politicians who once assumed the Japanese system was superior are now less sure. Ten years ago, we saw the publication of a book called Japan as Number One. And we did believe that the Japanese way of doing things was the best way. But perhaps we were a little arrogant. What's important now is how we can keep the good things about the Japanese way while at the same time learning from others by introducing superior systems and know-how from abroad. For years, government rules had kept foreign business out. But the barriers began to fall under international pressure. A big bang of the sort Britain had in the 1980s is still underway. The number of foreign businessmen in Tokyo has more than doubled. Foreign investors have also moved to take advantage of Japan's weakened state and huge debts. Land prices have fallen five times over since their 1990 peak. And owners who borrowed at the top of the market are still trying to pay back part of what they owe. The, the building that we're going to, we've been looking at for a while now. It's, yeah. You think finally the seller's getting ready to, uh, getting enough pressure from his lenders to... Uh, I think so, I think so. Part with it at a reasonable mm. price. Yeah, it's a building that we like a lot because it's, you know, sitting on that subway. Richard Mandel and, uh, works for an American company, Kennedy Wilson. It was built in uh, sort of the end of the bubble. To them, Japan looks like a bargain basement. It would have been about um, anywhere from 300 to 400 million dollars at its peak. And today, it's hard to estimate exactly, but somewhere between 50 and 60 million dollars and that's a good building the foreign invasion has become a nationalist scare story it's been taken up in a tv drama about an american takeover of an ailing japanese bank Employees quake as the manager from hell moves in. The new boss is not only American, she's a woman. Negashindeiru.あなたたちのこと調べました。はっきり言って、この銀行のお荷物と言わざるを得ません。何を根拠にそうおっしゃるんですか。私たちは私たちなりに頑張ってきたつもりです。それなりに誇りをも感じています。たとえ業績が上がっていなくても、現在の日本の状況を考えれば。業績が全てです。日本の経済状況は関係ありません。今日からボスは私です。不満だという方は
giant foreign retailers have at last forced their way onto the Japanese high street. Starbucks now has 78 stores. The Gap has opened 43 new branches in four years. The Japanese now look to foreign companies for low prices and a different sort of management. And the official government line is to welcome all this. Working with the non-Japanese is something we need to learn. It's very important. And in order to really activate the Japanese economy, in order to really adapt to the new age, foreign input, I think, is very important. So in the Ministry of Finance, I have been encouraging uh, the foreign corporations to come in. I have been supporting the mergers and acquisitions. Uh, that's a change for the Japanese, uh, traditional Japanese style of doing things. But we need a change. We need good stimulus from the foreign companies. For many Japanese, the need to adapt the national style and let non-Japanese in to share their game has caused consternation. These foreigners come in and grab almost bankrupt companies. They know they can do this because Japanese companies have no way of getting the capital to save themselves. They jump in and haggle. They just try to get things as cheaply as possible. It's just like hijacking. They get our companies for next to nothing. That's right. Japanese people have to fight back. The internet may turn out to be one weapon in that fight. As Japanese consumers face up to the perils of the electronic age, going online may help the country to recover its lead. Do you, uh, Yahoo? The country that built so many of the world's chips was slow to computerize its own offices. They were kept back for years by the problems of adapting software to deal with the thousands of characters in written Japanese. Masayoshi Son is one of Japan's richest entrepreneurs. He has now invested billions in bringing the digital age to Tokyo. He found red tape the biggest obstacle. Uh, in Japan, when, when you start something new, uh, very often the government says, well, the, you're the first case, and because there is no other case, we can't uh, give you permission. <laughs> so whenever they say that, uh, I say, why should that be the case? You know, uh, anybody, for anything, always the first thing uh, comes uh, for some new inventions or new revolutions. And if uh, nobody is first doing on something, Nothing uh, evolves, so uh, we, we just, uh, just go on. Son is convinced the Internet offers the best chance of liberating Japan from its blinkered mindset. Well, if nobody uh, challenge for the changes, then the society gradually you know, becomes uh, uh, less vital. You know? uh, if uh, people start keep on fighting for new changes, uh, we, there are many other companies or many other people who get stimulus from our move. And if we become successful, our, our other guys will also get you know, excited and they also challenge their own way. And if more and more people start challenging to uh, change their society, I think that would be good. Some put their faith in new technology, some in political reforms. But many believe that to get a real shift in national culture and attitudes, they have to start in the schools. Late in the evening in Matsukara Ura, Mrs. Kono's youngest son, Kiyoshi, is still doing his homework. Japan schools have traditionally stressed the importance of harmony and team spirit, application and hard work. 
The problem is that students are crammed too intensively from junior high school. By the time they reach university, they are exhausted. Because they've memorized so much, they can't think for themselves. Japanese education used to be geared for the creation of a standardized workforce for mass production. By putting students in this mold, the system created people with rounded personalities, with neither special talents nor faults. It was better not to have any self-expression or creativity. Those who succeeded were those who did exactly as their teachers told them and just copied everything they learned. But in the knowledge value society, new qualities such as self-expression and individuality have to be recognized. The school system has been highly centralized with the curriculum set from Tokyo. Children are used to working a six-day week, many more hours than British schools. They are among the most numerous in the world, with far higher math standards. But now teachers have been told to spend less time on formal learning and more on character development. The curriculum's been made less rigorous, and from 2002, children will get all Saturdays off. In the past, teachers tended to correct the bad parts of each child and make everyone the same. But today, we should help kids develop what they're good at. That's my ideal. Reformers hope that more creative children will emerge better suited to the information age. Education should help individuality shine. The curriculum should allow children to learn what they really want to learn and to spend as much time on it as they want. They shouldn't have to learn what they don't like. Why should a student who wants to study art also know integral calculus? It doesn't make sense. Schools have been told that instead of trying to iron out differences, they must encourage them. Once, all children had to paint the same subject in the approved style. But some think the old virtues would still be useful. This, this sort of uh, you know, education, giving uh, children more sort of leisure, uh, more creativity and so on, has, has failed. We have to work harder. At the Matsukawa Ura Festival, the emperor and empress review a march past from the local high school. It's a time for old-style formality and decorum. Out of respect for the imperial couple, nothing is allowed to break the harmony. Officials told Masunori Kono he'd have to conform for the day and change the color of his hair. Yesterday my hair was black. Because the emperor was coming, I had to dye it black. But as soon as it was all over, I dashed to the barber. <laughs>
They also realize they'll have to look out for themselves and adapt in a way their parents never had to.